don't you have a seat over there, please? All's been quiet on the RPG front for the past couple years, and were I to hazard an educated guess, I'd advance the theory that the hype and success surrounding a sweepingly average and flagrantly derivative title like Dragon's fucking Dogma is precisely to that fact. If hyperbole is sewage, then video game journalism is the Ganges, and as such, we've been neck deep in the feculence of the Fourth Estate since the launch of Dragon's Dogma. I myself found that while the game's more punishing Demon's Souls-esque approach to difficulty and quaint party mechanic can often feel refreshing, it ultimately buckled at the knees and outright collapsed under the weight of its needless devotion to this only mildly appealing premise, further reinforcing my working theory that there is no Japanese word for moderation. Ironic, I know, considering I reside in the nation responsible for soft drinks large enough to have their own fucking un Undertow, but Dragon's Dogma is a deeply flawed game regardless, beginning with the main fucking menu. It isn't often that a title screen significantly impacts the gameplay experience enough to even warrant a fucking mention, but the following simply has to be committed to public record. Whoever arrived at the fatuous epiphany that what a sandbox RPG in the year 2012 really needs is dated J-Rock theme music, should be mandatorily strapped to the nearest stable surface and force-fed a minute-by-minute recitation of Toonami's relaunch ratings. Chris Benoit is more popular than J-Rock in 2012. Step on into the year 1999 with me, Kenji. Mind you, this is Capcom, so it could have been much, much worse. Because next to Street Fighter Force, indestructible. I can feel it coming over me. I feel it all around me. I've been waiting for this moment. All my life is my destiny. This comes off sounding like Bohemian goddamn rhapsody, but when you find yourself courting comparisons to that variety of weapons grade abortion, it's probably time to reconvene the Nihongo Philic Algonquin and reconsider your creative fucking direction. Fortunately, after setting a land speed record for quickest time to push a fucking start button, I found myself pleasantly surprised by the game's bevy of customization options. As anyone who's played a tabletop role-playing game can attest, RPGs aren't just about playing a role, they're about creating a role you would want to play. To finally observe an Eastern developer that seems to have latched on to that fundamental concept is like catching a whiff of lavender spring while crowning in a muggy portajohn. Out of the gate, the game appears eager to throw just a few too many new elements at the player simultaneously. Arisen, you must use your charge attack while healing, blocking, equipping your lantern, and delivering a five-part lecture on atmospheric thermodynamics. Who would have thought the country that invented Bukaki would have so much difficulty with the concept of taking turns? But luckily, the enemy AI occasionally accommodates its own lackadaisical game design by shifting wildly from either munching your entire fucking head off like your T-zones coated in bath salts to refusing to attack under any circumstances, which I can confirm is even placing a Hawaiian naval base inside my ass, to my surprise, failed to elicit a sneak attack. The game's most apparent faults inevitably materialize in the form of developmental growing pains that more experienced open-world RPG developers have long since exercised from the equation. In frequent checkpoints, special Olympian AI and prohibitive walls of irrational difficulty all coalesce to form an occasionally fun but more often ingratiating final product. If a more competent developer with a less tenuous grasp of basic storytelling had been given free reign to refine the core formula of Dragon's Dogma, this game would have placed itself well in advance of the pack in the 2012 Game of the Year honors. Instead, a unique and appealing party system and rich customization is wasted on trite one-note caricatures whose cardboard performances belie their own narrative disposability, a fact the game elects to punctuate by overtly naming them, get this, PAWNS! So, let me see if I'm crystal fucking clear on this. The Arisen is given magical dragon powers to draw sentient beings through a nebulous portal against their fucking will so they can fill the ranks of his own private army and be beaten like a $10 steak, and despite the fact that he blatantly refers to them as pawns on a regular basis, they nevertheless find themselves semi-fucking erect at the prospect of throwing themselves in front of volleys of poisonous arrows for the benefit of this glorified fucking plantation owner. A Siberian ball sack isn't that cold, and before 
before you leap to Capcom's defense and call for suspension of disbelief, first ask yourself how improved this game would have been had they instead filled the party with well-written, honest-to-Jehovah human fucking beings with character motivations that extend outside of pop out of a portal and repeatedly shriek blatantly obvious things. Bandits arisen! No, they hold the advantage! No, they hold the advantage! Strength in numbers arisen. Now, so to the foe! Any that would target the arisen are mine. Any that would target the arisen are mine. Strength in numbers Did arisen. It. Strengthen numbers arisen. The master works all, you can't go wrong. Oh, what's that sunshine? It's easier to see at night with a lantern equipped, you say? Gee, thanks for that, Demosthenes. Why don't you have a seat in the corner and practice not shitting yourself? And yeah, while the ability to share pawns with online contacts is a treat, I could have lived to a ripe retiring age without the knowledge that half my Xbox Live friends list is comprised of latex dominatrix fetish freaks. The only real question is which I should choose. The pale elvish slag in a bustier with basketballs surgically grafted to a ribcage? Or the pale elven slag in a bustier with watermelons surgically grafted to a ribcage? Decisions, decisions. While Dragon's Dogma isn't Demon's Souls difficult, it's still harder than a porn star's tits and certainly much more challenging in some instances than it probably should be. So hard, in fact, that Capcom released a free patch that adds an easy mode. Consequently, Dragon's Dogma is a game that spins against the way that it drives. Ostensibly, as an open-world RPG, it's a game about exploration that nevertheless mercilessly punishes exploration, inevitably necessitating a tiresome grind and familiar climbs before the game at last relents and permits the player to advance, like sitting through 15 unskippable commercials before a DVD of your favorite movie. You know what's next. You know it has to be done to get there, but the game is nevertheless going to pedantically press its knee into your lower back and force you to eat shit until you finally hit the main menu. And the term for that is, altogether class, artificially lengthened gameplay. Alright, simply put, this game is bad. But it's only as bad as its squandered potential permits it to be. Nobody pisses and moans if the Bad Mother Trucker's sequel is shit. You can only be disappointed by something you actually permit yourself to harbor expectations for. Dragon's Dogma does just enough right to foster those expectations before slamming your dong in the nearest doorframe. All the same, there's a lot to like about Dragon's Dogma, and when the power button's within reach, there's twice as much to like. I'm Razorfist. God fucking speed. Fire!